CARICOM countries raised objections to a vote at the Organization of American States last month that could open the possibility for a military invasion of Venezuela. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Tuesday, October 1. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Ricardo Roberts. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, who has led responsibility for or lead responsibility for crime and security in the CARICOM quasi cabinet, told a news conference Tuesday that he met with the United States Secretary General Antonio Guterres on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly in New York to discuss the ongoing situation in Venezuela. Now, Rowley told reporters that in September, the OES brought up the 72-year-old Rio Treaty that would allow for the possible invasion. Last month's Antigua and Barbuda Foreign Minister E.P. Chet Green was critical of Haiti, a CARICOM country that voted in favor of the treaty being used. Only 17 legitimate member states of the OES are signatories to the 72-year-old treaty, which was created after World War II and which has no relevance in international law today. Now, of the 17 states, only three CARICOM countries are signatories, the Bahamas, Haiti, and Trinidad and Tobago. The issue of the security of the region is not to be taken for granted because there are powerful forces engaged in seeking to bring about military intervention as a solution to political problems. Now, the kinds of pressure that is brought to bear in Trinidad and Tobago by persons known and unknown, countries known and unknown, is known to the government. It might not be known to you, the media, or whatever, but we know, we know who we are dealing with and what we are dealing with. And we conduct the business of Trinidad and Tobago making sure that we stay laser focused on the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why when we saw people misrepresenting our receipt of refugees, we know what that means. We know what that means for Trinidad and Tobago. To portray us as a country harboring or receiving or by treating a number of refugees from Venezuela. It's all part of this whole question of how do we get done what we want to get done. Guyana's President David Granger has issued proclamations or the holding of regional and general elections on March 2, 2020. According to a government statement, Granger had acted in accordance with Article 61 of the country's constitution. The elections were triggered by a no-confidence motion against the coalition government last December. The president named the date in an address to the nation last week. But the main opposition People's Progressive Party, the PPP, said the March 2, 2020 election date and a call to return to parliament were an attempt by the government to blackmail the opposition. Back in July, Guyana's highest court, the Caribbean Court of Jews Justice, said the vote of no confidence was valid and urged all parties to adhere to the provisions of the country's constitution. Under the Guyana constitution, the election should take place 90 days after the vote of no confidence is passed. The constitution also makes provision for an extension of the period based only on a two-thirds majority vote in the parliament. Over in the Bahamas, opposition leader Philip Davis says recovery efforts in the wake of Hurricane Dorian will take priority over his party's plans to table a no-confidence motion against the government. The Progressive Liberal Party had planned to table the motion when Parliament meets next week. But Davis says there are more pressing issues to be addressed at this time. We think that the, the epic event that has just occurred um, the devastation and loss of lives and property. We think attention needs to be, more attention needs to be paid to that aspect. We need to be able to to discuss uh, that those the events of Dorian, um, pre-Dorian and post-Dorian, and uh, and have a fuller understanding of what occurred and how we could um, in the future minimize loss of lives and how we could better protect property. 
Meanwhile, Davis maintains that the government's failure to manage has contributed to an alleged cultural clash in hurricane shelters following the storm. I thought that you would have recognized that people coming through such traumatic experiences will heighten the concerns of cultural differences and you would have taken measure, take measures to, to, to minimize any fallout from that. And, and I think we see now that there was just no plans to address this matter in, this matter in, which, in the way it was. Meanwhile, an appeal from the Haitian minister for a moratorium on deportations seems to have fallen on deaf ears as the immigration minister insists that undocumented immigrants affected by Hurricane Dorian will not get a free pass. Earlier this month, Minister Ellsworth Johnson said the government would not be taking action against undocumented migrants in the wake of the storm. More in this eyewitness news report. Anybody comes and raises... Or, or, or you even think they have the intention to raise the issue of someone's immigration status, call me directly and I have strict instructions from the Prime Minister to deal with that post-haste. This was Immigration Minister Ellsworth Johnson's position three weeks ago at Cabinet. Today, this position has changed. So people who are in the shelters, um, are they safe for now? No, you're not safe. Listen, Mr. Watson, I had to say this to someone the other day, that Hurricane Dorian did not work a miracle. So it did not miraculously change your status. If you were undocumented, I mean, in, uh, not properly regulated in this country to see onto the immigration laws before the hurricane, despite the fact you went through the hurricane, that didn't regularize you. It did not regularize you. And the, and, and, and the, the shelter does not do that for you either. All persons uh, here... Uh, who are not properly uh, legalized to be here, uh, they're going to they're be dealt with. The minister sought to clarify why the change in position. But we are no longer facing the horrors of, of Hurricane Dorian. We are now in the reconstruction and rehabilitation stage. And we made it clear that the, the shelters would not be used as a means to circumvent the law. Minister Johnson also stopped short of saying whether they will be going into shelters to manually check the status of evacuees, but said these shelters won't be open forever. At, at this point, there's not that intention to do that. Uh, but, but, but I know the person that they're, they're now leaving the shelters. At some stage, people uh, people will have to leave, and um, uh, we we will do that. But there are still some persons. You will do what? You will check. Of course. We will we'll do road, we'll do road checks. We will be checking the mail boats. Uh, our people are on the ground in Freeport and in Abaco. Uh, we're, we're doing our intelligence work. But this isn't the only issue. Many of these residents are here under work permits. However, with no employment for most of them due to homes or businesses that they work for now destroyed, it means many will not be able to renew or qualify for those permits. You're watching Caribbean Newsline. The United Nations is raising concern over reports of violence and arson in Haiti as opposition supporters continue their protests, demanding the immediate resignation of President Juvenel Moïse. UN spokesperson Stefani Dujaric says the UN mission for justice support in Haiti has been calling on everyone to refrain from the use of violence. The National Police of Haiti says armed bandits are taking advantage of the unrest in the country to attack police stations and courts, free prisoners, and destroy evidence and records. Haitians have been taken to the streets in recent weeks as a result of a deepening economic crisis, along with chronic food and fuel shortages, setting fire to homes and various business places. Foreign Affairs Minister Bushit Edmund told the United Nations General Assembly that President Moïse was making efforts to pursue a national dialogue towards resolving the crisis. However, he cautioned that Haiti will not be able to recover without substantial support from the international community. The UN says its mission and international partners are in discussions with local participants to find a peaceful way out of the situation and alleviate the suffering of the population. 
The Barbados-based Surgical Life Inc. has acquired the assets of Trinidad-based Colonial Life Insurance Company Clico and British American Insurance Company Trinidad Limited. A statement from Surgical Group President and Chief Executive Officer Dodridge Miller assured policy holders of the same level of protection and service that the existing policyholders enjoy upon the completion of transfer of assets. The company did not disclose the amount paid to acquire the traditional insurance portfolios of both companies. But Clico's executive chairman and BAT chairman, Claire Gomez Miller, said Sagico emerged as the preferred buyer in an open and very competitive tender process with guidance from independent global industry experts. And coming up, a major court victory for St. Lucian, for St. Lucian family whose relatives was killed in the uh, U.S. by a police officer. Stay with us. More news after this. Victory for a St. Lucian family in a Texas court today after former police officer Amber Geiger was found guilty of the murder of 26-year-old Botham, Botham John Geiger, who is white, claimed to have mistakenly entered the apartment of Jean, the St. Lucian-born accountant, in September last year and fired two bullets at him. Now, loud cheers broke out in court after Judge Tammy Kemp read out the 12-member jury's verdict. The prosecution had accused her of bursting into Jean's apartment, commando style, and firing at him while he was eating a bowl of ice cream on his sofa on the night of September 6, 2018. Geiger told investigators that after a near 14-hour shift, she parked on the fourth floor of her apartment's complex's garage uh, rather than the third floor where she lived and found the apartment's door unlocked, resulting in her making a series of horrible mistakes. Uh, both um, Jean's parents, Bertram and Alison Jean, rejoiced in the courtroom upon hearing the conviction. Jean went to the United States to attend college and later started his career as an accountant. His murder drew widespread attention because of the strange circumstances and because it was one in a string of shootings of unarmed black men by white police officers. Members of the Trinidad and Tobago United uh, Teachers Association took uh, to the streets on Tuesday to protest the slow pace of salary negotiations for the period 2014 to 2017. Tutor President Lindsley Dodai said teachers were understandably impatient at this time as negotiations were yet to begin with the chief personal officer for the period 2014 to 2017. 
already halfway through the second period, which would run from 2017 to 2020. Dudai said teachers continue to operate on salaries dating back to 2013. And he says with the increased cost of living, it is unacceptable. He is hoping that the demonstration would compel the CPO to commence negotiations. According to an official from the Ministry of Education, 44.5% of teachers turned up at the secondary schools, while 37.5% of the primary school teachers came out. Trinidad and Tobago could see the return of former Minister of National Security Jack Warner to the political landscape. 76-year-old Warner was the political independent leader sorry, of the Independent Liberal Party, the ILP, a party he formed in July 2013 after he was not re-selected as the candidate for the Chaguanas West uh, by-election for the United National Congress. Now, Warner said he would not necessarily return through the ILP, but he plans to make a comeback. He said he was disappointed in the People's National Movement government as well as the uh, UNC, as the, period, as the people do not have a sense of hope, but he plans to bring that back. Grenada's Foreign Minister Peter David has called for the development of a foundation to help small island developing states in their collective global fight against the negative effects of climate change. Now addressing the United Nations General Assembly, David said challenges associated with climate change and poverty are compounded in small island states by lack of funds and the increase in demand for the already limited resources. And he called for the SIDS to work together to source financing for adaptation. He also made a call for a country-specific vulnerability index to determine gradua graduation to middle income status. Affirming the view that effective multilateralism based on an inclusive approach that takes into account the needs of all countries is the only way in which we can address global challenges like climate change and poverty reduction. It is clear that there is a strong relationship between climate change and poverty with the most vulnerable being the ones that are most negatively impacted, while at the same time being the ones that have contributed the least to the problem. And ahead of Newsline Sport, a record eighth straight CPL victory for Guyana Amazon Warriors. Stay with us. Sport is next. <laughs> an emergency, you can help yourself and others by looking, listening, and linking. Looking because you want to see if the person has some signs that is in distressing. Looking for the symptoms, how best you can support the person. And then listening, because listening is very important. Listening with your ears, listening with your eyes. If you do that well, then you'll be able to link them to the appropriate resources. Be ready, look, listen, and link. Hi, I'm Brittany Dixon, and you're watching Finding Fit, the show where I pair up one client with two trainers. Trainer number one. Oh my gosh. It's about fitness, comedy. You know, I can do this all day, you know. Drama. Um, in the future, we cannot be late. Inspirational stories and so much more. You are going to love it. You can catch Finding Fit Prime Time this fall on Care Vision. Well, sitting atop the New York Times list for best fiction writing this week is, well, the New York Times. The media, the left, and the gang of would be 2020 presidential hopefuls 
renewed their calls this week for the immediate commencement of impeachment proceedings against Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh in the wake of salacious sexual conduct allegations in the Times piece penned by reporters Robin Pogrebin and Kate Kelly. The piece was an excerpt from a book by the two reporters that included details of a purported assault by Kavanaugh. Ghana Amazon warriors held their nerve in the closing stages of an onslaught from Karen Pollard and Darren Bravo to outlast defending champions Trinbago Knight Riders by 19 runs and clinch an unprecedented eighth straight victory in the Caribbean Premier League on Monday. The Amazon Warriors look to be making a gallant effort or defense of a target of 186 when they reduced TKR to 53 for four in the ninth over, but Pollard stepped in to slam an explosive 71 from 38 balls and Bravo was unbeaten on 58 from 46 balls that revived the team's chances. Now Pollard, the new West Indies white ball captain and veteran Wendy's batsman, Bravo shared 112 for the fourth wicket before running out of steam in a tense finish at the Queen's Park over. Now earlier, Chantra Paul Hemraj hit the top score of 66 from 42 balls and Wendy's batsman Shimran Hetmaya cracked 48 from 38 to put the wheels in motion for the Amazon Warriors. But Romario Shepard hit a crucial 32 not out as the visitors posted 185 for six from their 20 overs. Hemraj and Hetmeyer shared 98 for the second wicket before the Amazon Warriors innings went into a tailspin and they were wobbling on 143 for six in the 18th over. Now the victory meant Amazon Warriors kept their clean sheet and set a CPL record for the number of consecutive victories in the tournament. TKR faced the visiting Barbados Tridents on Wednesday needing to clinch a victory or else leave their hopes of qualification for the finals in the hands of other teams. Still in cricket, independent assessors have cleared the bowling action of West Indies Vice Captain Craig Braffitt for the second time in his career. The 26-year-old off-spinner had been reported for suspected illegal bowling action during the second test against India last month in Jamaica. But the International Cricket Council, the sport's world governing body, confirmed on Tuesday that his action has been found to be legal and the player can continue bowling in international cricket. Braffitt underwent a bowling assessment on September 14th in the English city of Loughborough, where he was revealed, uh, it was revealed that the amount of elbow extension for all his deliveries was within the 15 degree level of tolerance permitted. Now, Braffitt has taken 18 wickets in 58 tests with his part time off spin, including a remarkable spell of six to 29 against uh, uh, 629 against Sri Lanka in 2015 in Colombo. Uh, two years later, his action was reported after the first test ag against England at Edgebaston, but another independent assessment at Loughborough less than a fortnight later found his action to be legitimate. And the region's top women's cricketers will get the opportunity to play cricket during the CPL. TTT's Ruskin Mark tells us more about the T10 challenge. First time T10 has been played on the international stage. Uh, we see it as a, a significant uh, step forward in, in building franchise uh, women's cricket in the region. Um, so we're extremely excited about it. An excited Pete Russell there, who sees the introduction of the two T10 women's matches to be played before the second eliminator and the final on October the 10th and 12th, respectively, as a significant step towards exposing women to franchise cricket and raising their overall profile. The Thursday game will be called the NLCB Challenge, uh, and on the Saturday it will be the, the Courts Invitational. Um, the two teams competing have been selected by Cricket West Indies, uh, from their professional pool of players. Um, so they'll be very competitive, but each available West Indies player is playing. Um, obviously, there are a few injuries, but uh, we're very excited about the strength of both squads. In addition to the CPL, Cricket West Indies is also on board with the initiative alongside the TNT government. 
this uh, invitation to participate with CPL came at a very uh, relevant and interesting time when the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs, we are now about to uh, launch or start a women and girls program, which we have entitled Pink Rain Campaign. And the Pink Rain Campaign is, gain, is geared at uh, promoting women and girls in sport, uh, trying to get more women moving again, the working women moving again, to uh, promote sporting activity and physical activity at the school age level. Echoing similar sentiments with Johnny Graves, the CEO of Cricket West Indies, who sees improving opportunities for girls to get involved in cricket as a top strategic priority of the board and fully endorses this move. The matches will be shown live around the world at the business end of the CPL. And to horse racing now for the second straight weekend is Barbadian rider Patrick Husband swept both stakes races on a Woodbine card when he won the Canadian $150,000 Grade 3 Durham Cup and Ontario Derby at the prestigious Toronto Oval. The 46-year-old first partnered with 5-2 choice the Great Day in Race 3 to win the Durham over a mile and eighth using a gate-to-wire effort to eclipse the three-year-olds and upward by a nose in a photo finish. Husbands then returned in race nine with 2-1 second choice global access to wear down pace setter and favorite Avi's flatter to beat the three-year-olds by one and a quarter lengths and also going a mile and eighth in a track record of one minute 48.24 seconds. And that's the sport. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Right now, we have the second round lineup for you, right? So the artists are here and they're ready. I'm not going to waste any time, right? Big Dog, you ready? ready, ready Juba, ready, you ready? ready. All right, DJ, lock the cage. Yeah, I'm in and at you with the scope. Come through, tie you up with rope. There's no hope. When I come through, man, lose your patience. You know, we've been waiting, waiting me for something. The real Dan Dada when we step on the rhythm, and everybody know what Juba Dan in at this. Now waste no time, not take no time, not write my line, rather come on, bust a few. So let's see what's happening here um, on the side of St. Croix. Um, some aromatics being cut here by the, uh, the, on the side of Team Jim Croy. And um, some pumpkin as well being cooked. And a pan with a little bit of oil, it looks like. And, yeah, be, um, getting hot. And some nice work being done here by the team on St. Croy. Again, the major developments of this day, CARICOM countries raise objections to a vote at the OAS last month that could open the possibility for a military invasion of Venezuela and in sport a record 8th Street CPL victory for Guyana Amazon Warriors. As Caribbean Newsline for news on sports round the clock, log on to carnanews.com. We'll be back here again tomorrow, but from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching. Have yourselves a good night.